thus far today, we've heard about individual, things you can do as an individual to enhance your career, and things you can do in your organization, issues like diversity and inclusiveness and so forth. So for the last topic of the day, let's turn now to the future and talk about inspiring and fostering future generations of diverse leaders in the community. So, today we've got a really fascinating lineup with a four women who focus on different parts of the digital career pipeline, if you will, for lack of a better phrase. And my first question is, I'd love to hear from each of you about your unique perspective on fostering women at that particular stage of the pipeline that you focus on. So I'm gonna start with Jocelyn for this one. Um, yeah, we're sharing one mic here. Tell us about your... Sure. So we started Hopscotch. My co-founder and I are both women, and we got started with Hopscotch primarily because we um, got into technology a lot later than a lot of our friends who were boys and who all kind of looked similar. They were all sort of white, nerdy, upper middle class guys um, who had grown up with access to computers when they were young. And uh, when we asked them, you know, how did you get into programming? Um, they said, you know, when I was growing up, I had um, video game. like, I, I, it was me and my computer, and I really fell in love with video games, and then after um, I played video games for hours and hours and hours, I wanted to learn how to code them, and so they started coding when they were, like, 12 or 13 years old, and so by the time they're in their early 20s, they've had over 10 years of programming experience, and we contrasted that to the few women engineers that we knew, and a lot of them did not have similar experiences. My co-founder, who was an excellent engineer, didn't start programming until she was a senior in college, um, and so had a lot of time to make up. So the reason that we first got interested in building Hopscotch is we said, you know, what would the equivalent experience be for women? Um, like, what would be um, a, a game that kids, when I was a young kid or when my co-founder was, you know, 10 or 11 or 12 years old, what, what would be the thing that would stoke their interest in programming um, the same way that video games had done for a lot of our male hacker peers. So that's where the genesis of our product actually came. Um, and, um, and it's been really exciting, just sort of trying to develop this, this product that, you know, what did little Sam, what did little Jocelyn, um, what would we have wanted when we were growing up? So focusing on the very beginning of that pipeline then. So Reshma, you focus more on teenagers. Tell us a little bit about that. So um, the problem that Girls Who Code is trying to solve is the, the gender gap in, in computer science majors. And so we're really looking at from 12 to 18. So basically, if you were to look at a graph um, from 2000 today of computer science majors, every year about 40,000 men would declare CS as a major and about 14,000 women. And in 2011, that number for men spiked from 40,000 to 70,000. But what do you think happened with women? stayed the same or it went a little bit down. What do you think happened in 2011? The social network came out and every boy decided that he wanted to be Mark Zuckerberg and have a $100 million exit. <laughs> and women didn't care. And so what you've seen happen essentially since the 1980s is this enormous decline of women in technology. I mean, literally, there was almost parity in the 80s and today that number's less than 18%. So at a time where women use social media at a rate of 600% more, year after year after year, women are opting out. And so we decided in 2011 to do something about it, and it's really awesome to be here at AppNexus because, quite frankly, Girls Who Code would not exist if it was not for AppNexus. So in, in 2011, as a non-coder, I decided to start an organization called Girls Who Code. We can talk about that later. But one of the first calls I made was to my friend Brian O'Kelly, and I said, I got this program. I wanted to start by teaching 20 girls. I need a conference room. Do you have one? And he's like, yeah, I think I can hook you up. And so we borrowed a conference room from AppNexus, and we went from teaching 20 girls in 2011 to reaching 10,000 girls in 41 states today. And, <laughs> and uh, unfortunately or fortunately for AppNexus, we never left. So we went from a staff of one to a staff of two to a staff of seven to a staff of 50, and they still house us for free. And so for me, it's a real example of an amazing, amazing, amazing partner. Um, and when you have people who believe in you like that, like that's how you, that's how you change the gender gap. Awesome. 
Uh, my niece is now a girl who codes, thanks to your program, so thank you for that, my 17-year-old niece. So I don't know if it's exactly literally the next stage in the pipeline, but I'll, for the sake of argument, let's say that entrepreneurialism is the next stage in the digital yeah. career pipeline. So Susan, can you tell us a little bit about sure. your Sure. <laughs> um, and I think it is actually because uh, we started BBG Ventures because we saw an enormous number of young women coming out of not just engineering schools, but B schools and colleges. And instead of doing what all of my peers did, which was to figure out what company they wanted to go work for, they've decided that they don't want to go work for a company, they want to build something. Um, the problem is that for young women, it is significantly harder to raise capital. So that's what I'm focused on. How do we get more capital to more women? Um, they have a harder time getting capital for a couple of reasons. One is that the legacy venture capital world um, is 96% men. I know that's a staggering number, but only 4% of the partners, these are the people who can make investment decisions, are female. So what you see is, um, one, it is harder to get in to see them because you have to have a referral most of the time in order to get an appointment. Um, once you do get in, you get a lot of the, you know, I'm going to have to check with my wife about whether she thinks that's a good idea. Uh, or you get, um, so what is a blowout? <laughs> Which actually happened to one of my entrepreneurs when she was out in, in, uh, in Sand Hill Road pitching Glam Squad. <laughs> um, so uh, I used to think that the issue was just to get more women accepted as partners at these legacy VCs. That's a long haul. I think it's going to be uh, very difficult for that to happen. Uh, it, it's, it's just hard to get people to open up a partnership, period, and I understand that. They've been working together a long time. What we need are more alternative VCs, alternative ways for, uh, for women to be funded. So that's our focus. Fantastic. BBG stands for Built by Girls, right? Built by Girls. <laughs> and so finally, Judy, you, I guess, take care of the end of that pipeline. Professional, senior, high accomplishing women. Tell us about your work there. Well, so I've spent 29 years working at Verizon, a giant corporation. And of course, the reality of sitting around being surrounded, rooms full of men, is that in order to get women in the leadership positions, we need leaders, women coming up the pipeline. But once they get there, the thing you have to understand, and many of you may think you'll never work for such a massive corporation, but you may. You may find yourself there, or your companies may become incredibly large companies. And the thing about being a leader in a large company like that is you have to recognize, number one, that you have to figure out how to move the masses. We're talking about tens of thousands of people that are trying to run gigantic operations. And two, you have to figure out how to work the system. Sometimes that means changing the system, it means working within it and around it, but one way or another, you gotta work the system. And there's a wonderful uh, writer on leadership named Michael Maccabee, if you haven't heard about him, go look him up and read his books. And he talks about three different kinds of leaders. There are strategic leaders, the people who create the vision and the purpose for the organization. There are operational leaders, people who know how to execute on a large scale. And there are network leaders, people who know how to engender trust and get people to communicate so information flows up and down. And the thing about in a large corporation is you may be good at all of those things, or you may only be good at one of those, in which case you've got to have the skill to find the people who can do the others. But you can't necessarily be chief cook and bottle washer when you're trying to manage 10,000 plus people. So you have to recognize that all those skills are needed and then figure out what you're good at and how to find other people to surround yourself with. So I think that connects with something that we had a really interesting conversation with on the phone, which is that this women in tech sort of shorthand actually packs a lot in there, and that it's not always all about B 
being the coder, there are different ways to lead. So I'm going to kind of combine a couple of themes that we talked about and say, on the one hand, what is it besides coding that being a woman leader, any kind of leader in digital entails, but then what is the role of coding? Let me open that up. Um, Judy, actually, why don't you describe your thoughts there? Yeah, so what we had talked about was, well, first of all, what does it mean to be a leader? And the best definition I've heard is the simplest one. It was mentioned earlier as a leader who has people who follow them. You can be a great visionary, but if you turn around and no one's following you, you're not a leader. So the question is, how do you, what skill does it take to get people to go to places that they would not otherwise go on their own to follow you? And I think the most important lesson that I've learned over the years is there are a lot of ways to do it. The wrong formula to just think that you have to be like some other leader that you saw. Uh, a, a great way to describe it that I heard years ago is there are people who lead from the front, right? They charge up the hill and they turn around and they've got a mass of people behind them. There are people who lead from behind. They're good at encouraging and coaxing and letting people do what they're good at. And then there are people who lead from the middle, where the whole team ends up at the top of the hill and nobody quite knows how they got there, but they got there. And they're all great ways to lead. And the key is, if you're gonna lead with passion and authenticity, you have to know which one of those styles is yours. You can't try to imitate something that doesn't come from the heart. You have to lead from the heart. So being passionate, I think, is key. Um, being bold. Uh, leadership, I often say leadership is a choice, not a title. And especially in big companies, if you're waiting for somebody to ordain you as leader, you're going to miss out on lots of opportunities. And this may be counterintuitive, but be humble. Because the leader is only one person on the team. Sorry to use a sports analogy, but I like sports, and I'm sure most people here do. You know, the quarterback is just one role on the team. They ain't going to win if they don't have a great wide receivers. So you may have the skills of a great leader, but don't mistake and think that you can accomplish it alone. So taking that down to practical terms, that may mean that you can lead as a digital leader. You can lead in technology without necessarily being the most senior technical person. And I think that was something we talked about. But let me switch yeah. it back over to Jocelyn and maybe Reshma to say, so why then is it so important to get women to code at a young age? I think there are so many benefits um, from learning how to code um, that don't necessarily, uh, they accrue to you even if you do not end up becoming an engineer or the, you know, the CTO of a company or go into doing coding at all for a career. Um, I think primarily, especially at a young age right now, if you think about the world and how, um, how it has evolved in the past 20 years and how software is sort of, it's a cliche, but how software is really eating the world um, and how it's, computers are sort of the most powerful forces that there are out there. The idea that you have control over some of the most powerful things out there, that is deeply empowering and that you understand how it works. Um, if you think about how many people use software compared to the number of people that are able to create it and make it, that seems, the proportions are why, you know, that's, that it's crazy, right? A, a tiny, tiny fraction of the number of people um, that consume software are actually able to create it and understand how it works. So I think that there are also, we, you know, when we, we talk about hopscotch and its use in school and kids um, learning to code, there are all kinds of additional reasons outside of just learning how to program um, that you learn. There's a lot of attitudinal stuff, and Reshma, I think you can also speak to that, but um, primarily around sort of like algorithmic thinking, thinking about abstraction, um, uh, attitudinal, like uh, around grit, and about around like working with other people and sort of passing off a project in between people. There's all, all these sort of smaller things, but I think the larger theme is that, you know, and uh, continuing the theme of leadership, the idea that you um, can control this thing is that is incredibly powerful and that you have the ability to sort of make a dent in the universe in that way. I think that in and of itself instills the sort of confidence that leaders need, so. And I think just to build on that real quick, I think the importance of coding is that for women it socializes failure. And I just want to tell a quick story. 
So, so many of our girls, the first week we teach them kind of basic programming languages. And every single time, they'll write their line of code and they'll call over a teacher, they'll call over Emily and say, okay, and Emily will be like, press enter. And they're like, I can't, what if it's wrong? <laughs> and it's like, that's life, right? It's so important to learn how to fail and to fail and to fail and to iterate and to fail and to iterate and to fail and to iterate. And that is what coding teaches you, teaches you how to have a, super a superpower of failure. And not be broken. Yeah. Awesome. I think we could talk about this all day long. I'm sure each of you has so much more to say about it. But I'm going to ask you now for a tweet length, if you don't mind, sound bite of what's one thing that you think each woman here in the audience today could do to, I had a good phrase for this. What was it? Oh, I lost it. To become an activist, to empower more women to become leaders in the, the in technology community. So, tweet length. Oh, Inspi inspire a girl to learn how to code. <laughs> I would say that too, but you already said it. So, I would say get together with more women because I think women entrepreneurs meeting each other and just sort of women leadership, I think, you know, sh being very honest and sharing your experiences, like, make sort of makes everybody bolder. Scott. I would say hold a mirror up to the women around you and tell them the leadership qualities that you see in them. That's good. And I'm going to break the tweet rule, sorry. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is to make other women aware of the fact that you don't have to become a computer scientist to become a leader in technology. Think of Sheryl Sandberg. There are a hundred different things you can do within a technology company that are critical roles that will drive you to the top of that company. Um, and whatever you want to do, if you're a 15-year-old girl, whether you want to be Mark Zuckerberg or you want to be the next Hillary Clinton or you want to run a fashion empire, technology is going to be key. Awesome. Forgiven. <laughs> Forgiven.